Yeah, it's the end of the day. Everything's been an exhausting day, right? This is about the time you lose the motors. So let's go ahead and talk about that. One thing to that last point, John, one thing we do with our big deformities is we check a ROTEM after we're done with our osteotomies before we're putting our rods in. We published a paper on about 30 patients where we actually reduced the number of products, blood products we had to um, deliver because we were doing a, a corrective uh, basically uh, transfusion like cryoprecipitate or platelets if they needed it. We weren't just giving them blood, the, you know, FFP, plate, whatever. We were giving them what they needed. And so a ROTEM is one good idea in a big deformity sort of after eight or 10 hours. Well, we'll finish up with this loss of interoperative neuromonitoring signals. Let's just start with a case. This is a 44-year-old uh, who presented basically with back and abdominal pain. An MRI was eventually done and showed this kind of sinister-looking lesion here that you can see on the sagittal weighted images and the axial weighted images here. And the question was, you know, what was the differential diagnosis? Well, we thought it was very much likely a primary tumor. And so we went ahead and did a biopsy. And this revealed that it was a low-grade cartilaginous neoplasm, probably consistent with a sar chondrosarcoma. So the question was at this stage, what to do with this gentleman with this lesion like this, that you can see sort of abuts the disc spaces, that, that was the T9 vertebral body, and abuts the disc spaces at uh, T8-9 and T9-10. And so we decided to go ahead and do an on-block spondylectomy from a posterior approach. And so, you know, th this was uh, something that we spent quite a bit of time doing and it took quite a bit of time. We placed our fixation, we used fixation above and below, and the motors were good during our fixation. The motors were good during our uh, decompression. The motors were good after we took the nerve roots and had a clamp, uh, had a, a basically a vascular clip on bilaterally for a few minutes and everything looked good. The motors were good when we went ahead and did all our dissection. The motors were good <laughs> before we went ahead and started to roll the tumor out. But what we did was we went ahead and distracted a little bit when we went to go ahead and take the tumor out. So after we had rolled this tumor out, what we found is that we had lost bilateral MEPs, except for very diminished right EHL, and the SSCPs were unchanged. And so the thought was what to do at this stage. And one of the things that we're gonna go through here is a checklist. And the key in this checklist is communication between anesthesia, neuromonitoring, and the surgeon. So the first thing we did was make sure that we could go ahead and still had uh, you know, reliable upper extremity MEPs and SACPs. And that was in fact the case. These were isolated bilateral lower extremity losses. We went ahead and made sure there wasn't a dip in um, you know, the mean arterial pressure or they hadn't changed anesthetic technique. And sure enough, there wasn't. So we repeated them and there was an absence, not a diminution, an absence of the MEPs. So at that stage, we paused, we removed the distraction. I irrigated with ice saline for about 20 minutes. And gradually, after about 20 minutes, the MEPs started to return, but they never quite reached the baseline. Fortunately, postoperatively, he was full strength to confrontation immediately postoperatively. And within 24 hours, it returned to five over five strength. So it was really key at that stage to go ahead and think about what we did. And so this is a good checklist, and this is a, a reference from the group at UCSF. Praveen Mamanemi has published this in a couple of different uh, environments right now. Neurosurgical Focus is one that I can think of that was published probably about 10 years ago. And there's some things that you gotta do. First of all, as a spine surgeon, you gotta stop what you're doing currently. You gotta assess and make sure there's nothing compressing on the spinal cord. And if you would perform a maneuver, you gotta go ahead and consider reversing that maneuver, like reversing the, the, the distraction or, or, and so forth, or the correction of a deformity in this case. For the neurophysiologist, you wanna make sure that you can reliably recreate what, you, what you've told somebody and that it's not an anesthetic related issue. You wanna go ahead and repeat the MEPs and the SACPs. You wanna um, check to make sure that the leads are in properly. I've had that happen before where I was doing a thora upper thoracic uh, kyphectomy and we lost the motors on one side and sure enough, the bolt had fallen out uh, of somebody and you know we had to make sure that they actually could transmit good MEPs. And then you wanna see if they were asymmetric changes or symmetric changes, whether they're global changes, and the neurophysiologist has to talk to you. And then finally, and most importantly, you gotta communicate with the anesthesiologist. 
because the anesthesiologist is up there and they're like, well, you know, what do I care? And so, you know, they, they, they're, they've turned the Mac up to, to one, you know, all of a sudden and you've globally lost MEPs that happened to me the other day. And so you gotta make sure that they haven't changed anesthetic techniques, haven't changed the depth of the anesthetic, and that they've also maintained the, the hemoglobin and hematocrit, and that they haven't changed um, um, anything in terms of their anesthetic technique, which could affect the MEPs. So what we did in this case was drive the MEPs, and like I said, reverse our distraction, and that went ahead and um, fortunately corrected the problem. This is what we had achieved. This is the on-block spondylectomy, and you can see what we went ahead and did there, and, went, and actually took a fairly big segment, and of course it was right when we finished rotating this thing out, and there was no way to reverse what we had done uh, once, once we had done that. So this is what the construct we used. And fortunately, as I said, he returned uh, you know, with his uh, good, uh, good motor function, although we kept him in the NCC for a couple of days, pushing his mean arterial pressures above 85, just to be on the cautious side. But of course, because we pushed the MEPs, I think he developed some post-operative complications. But subsequently, he's done well and is now three years out without recurrence. So that's, that, that checklist right here is the key to this. And I think it's something that's important to go ahead and, and ch take a look at and sort of acknowledge and, and particularly, you know, pass it on to your co-residents, your co-attendings co and so forth and so on. So that when you get in trouble in the, in the OR, you have, a, have something to fall back on, a mechanism to fall back on. Thanks. So I hope you all uh, liked this high energy uh, espresso-like shot in the afternoon with high value things. So is it safe to say that MEPs are too sensitive and not specific enough, especially after a prolonged case, uh, let's say six to eight hour deformity surgery with extensive uh, neural element release? And at the same token, is it not common also, doctor, uh, that the SEPs decline gradually, especially in a, a diabetic patient, uh, towards the end of a long case? So <laughs> is it true that there's too much sensitivity and maybe not enough specificity unless you read the fine print between those two modalities. Yeah, that is true. The, the one key thing I think that I mentioned in this uh, presentation, and the only thing that gave me solace during this whole event was that the SSCPs remained unchanged. And so if it's two modalities that go out, I get a lot more concerned than if it's one modality that gives out. That is great. So we have one, uh, any other questions? Otherwise we will, please, one second, microphone. This is work, yeah. Um, wake up test, I know it's in the checklist, but yes. I, I've never seen one, just chatting with anesthesiologists, they've never done one, is it? It is, first of all, it's something I would not recommend doing unless you've preemptively talked to the patient and warned them that this is something you might do. Now, I've done that with like on block spondylectomies, and we considered doing it in this case, and we would have probably done it, moved to that as the next stage before we went, you know, until the MEP started to drift back in. So, as a result, I, I've done them. You, you really have to coach the patient pre, before surgery to, to acknowledge that this might happen. And, you know, there are certain people that you're never going to do this on, and you know, you know who I'm talking about. I mean, there's, there are people who can't handle that. Tim, as a senior educator, Leo had a question. Can, do you want to go first, Leo? Okay. As a senior educator, I'm not calling you old, um, how can we teach these kind of horror or difficult scenarios in a more systematic fashion to our younger trainees? <laughs> Great question. I, I do think it comes from experience, and I think, you know, as Ted mentioned, taking your own pulse is really important in these situations. Um, you know, because that, and you just have to work through it methodically. And having a checklist like that uh, for these situations with with intense bleeding, with when the motors go out, and if it happens intraoperatively, you know, just I guess talking to the trainees about, hey, you know, this is what I think I'm thinking, this is what I'm going to do, and um, you really have to detach yourself from the situation at that point and and just think through it. Jens, could could I add to that, please? Um, in the, the to, on this question about uh, educating the, the newer spine surgeons, um, it's on us to to make sure that we're systematically having those conversations, right? So you have a lab next week on uh, wires and hooks, which you probably very seldom use, right? 
there's a reason why you're, you're having a lab on that, because you want them to have those tools, right? Well, well these scenarios are other, another thing that it, the burden is on us to have those conversations, right? Uh, I get that you've never seen a Stagnero wake-up test, but when I was a resident, we did them every time we did a deformity case. And, and so we should be having those conversations about what's that like. Um, and while they're still asleep and they're not responding to commands, but you can make sure that they have um, a clonus, ankle clonus, you can start to feel a little bit better, like, okay, we, we don't have a complete injury here. Um, those are the kinds of things that even though you may not see it during the course of your training, we should at least be having those conversations. And, um, so my question is uh, as a segue to uh, what both of you guys are saying. And um, what I was thinking is, as, as there's a, there's a wake-up test, and as we're discussing here, but uh, another possibility that I don't know if there's ever going to be a push or a bandwidth to do that is in cranial neurosurgery, uh, there's a lot of surgeries that are done awake with the patient, you know, put to sleep, and then the patient is woken up, and then the critical part of the surgery is done with the patient awake so you can have uh, neuromonitoring. Uh, you can actually examine the patient while you're doing the surgery. Do you, do you guys think there's ever going to be um, some kind of headspace to do that in spine surgery where perhaps, you know, I know this sounds crazy, but maybe if you're doing something that you consider extremely dangerous to the spinal cord, perhaps the patient is actually awake during the part of the surgery while you actually operate on that part. Yeah, um, yeah so uh, that was I, done, right? Simmons, yeah. Simmons, and it was horrible. It was <laughs> miserable. <laughs> Horrible. Yeah, they don't it's, know what Simmons a, is. This is I one mean, of those. We there, used to do that what for, Simmons uh, did. for osteotomies, cervical thoracic osteotomies for ankylosing spondylitis patients. We would do them sitting up in a beach chair. And uh, my job as the fellow was to scrub out and go do the neuro exam. Uh, and and, and, and it's, it's scary because uh, they, you have to get them so light that they can follow commands. And yet in that twilight zone, they can start moving in ways you don't want them to move. The other thing is when you do a cranial surgery, you can numb the periosteum pretty well. And when we used to do these awake surgeries with George Ogeman all the time for epilepsy, you could really numb up the periosteum, put them out with propofol, numb up the periosteum, get good control. It's hard to numb up the periosteum in an on block spondylectomy effectively. And it is in a, you know, in a PSO and so forth. And I think that's the difference is a, it's a lot more pain involved. Good stuff. Well, thank you. Let's go to the last lab, and then I'll ask the faculty to come up for a final conclusion. Rod, can you hear us?